Wow. <laughs> Look at this crowd. I think this is the largest so far. You think so? I think so. But I was told everybody was supposed to wear a bow tie like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got the bow tie memo. <laughs> Uh, and wanted to thank you all uh, for being out tonight. Um, I actually have a script and want to thank you all for being here at the, uh, at the Commonwealth Club. Um, uh, uh, my name is James Taylor. I'm the professor of politics at the University of San Francisco. And I'm excited to be on stage today with Lawrence Lessig, the professor of law and leadership at Harvard Law School. Along with teaching, Lawrence is one of the founders of Creative Commons, a longtime advocate for comprehensive campaign, finance reform, and author of the new book, Fidelity and Constraint, How the Supreme Court Has Read the American Constitution. In Fidelity and Constraint, Lawrence shines a spotlight on a critically important center of power in America, the nine judges in the U.S. Supreme Court and how they read the Constitution. With partisan gridlock throughout Washington, the court has emerged as the decider of some of the most important issues in American politics. We're very excited to have him tonight as we discuss this critical issue uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lawrence Lessig. So we have about 35 minutes to talk, and of course your questions will be integrated into the ongoing uh, question. Um, and so uh, we wanted to definitely uh, let you know that you'll be able to, to get your questions in. Um, I, I, when I, I watched uh, Professor Lessig pre prepare, uh, in my preparation I watched him online and just giving talks. And I just said, why did they have me come and sit with this man? He just needs to be let loose. <laughs> you all know he's, he's dynamic and charismatic and, and brilliant. And so I just wanted to get out of his way and allow him to talk directly to you. And so I guess my first question would be, if you could sort of not, you know, if, to sort of avoid trying to tease out the book from you step by step, I'm wondering if you could sort of give us an overarching thesis of the book, its major components talking about translation um, and, and the different elements that you bring out in terms of fidelity of purpose, fi I mean fidelity of meaning and fidelity of role and how, that, how those interact. How do we know these things when we see them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so this book makes me seem like an incredibly naive person because it tries to paint the Supreme Court as an institution that's seeking a very important kind of integrity or fidelity in our tradition. And I, I think it's very important to try to understand the institution like this because it's a critical institution in our democracy and if we become as cynical about the Supreme Court as we have become about politicians or about Congress, then all hope is lost. So the question was, is there a way to understand the history um, that sees it in this charitable light? Um, and, I, and the story I tell in this book is that I think, in fact, if you um, look at justices who we typically think of as conservative and justices who we typically think of as liberals, they both engage in the same kind of interpretive practice. Both of them grab values that they think of as fundamental to the Constitution. And they try to find ways to keep them alive across time. I say that's a process of translating those values across time. And that act of translation is a very constructive, creative, some might say activist, effort as it's the judges pushing forward this set of values as the world around changes. But in that practice of translation, that fidelity to the original meaning across time, there's a constant pushback from the context in which they find themselves that makes it hard for them to always continue with that practice of translation. And so sometimes they have to give it up, they back away. Um, and, and here the, the clearest example of this cycle is really from the conservatives. So the conservatives have long insisted our constitution embeds a principle of federalism. And the idea of federalism is the framers were intent on constraining the power of Congress to leave most of the power in the states. But as we know over time, the power of Congress has grown as the constitution's Commerce Clause, the clause that gives Congress the power to regulate commerce, has been read to be more and more powerful. And the court has at many moments tried to cut back 
on the power of Congress. It's tried to say the power of commerce is restricted to just interstate commerce or doesn't uh, reach commerce that is uh, affecting manufacturing or all sorts of constraints like that. And the original effort at constraining the court hit a roadblock just after the Depression when FDR insisted that the federal government should have more power than, Congress, than the Supreme Court was allowing. And at that point, the court backed away. The court basically said, okay, we give up. And they allowed Congress to regulate much more extensively and, and became a much more powerful Congress again. And then Rehnquist, starting in about 1976, tried it again. It's like, we still believe there's a principle of federalism built into this Constitution, and we're going to try to create new restrictions on the scope of Congress's power to pull them back again. And he tried, and there was an effort that then um, failed, and he had to go back to start again, and then he tried again with Justice O'Connor supporting him, and they had to go back again. And there's this constant back and forth as they try to push forward this value, and they're pushed back by the different constraints inside the Constitution. And, and do you think judges over time are conscious of these, of these principles of, of meaning and role? I think that they um, absolutely are conscious of the value they think they're pushing. So conservatives pushing federalism, liberals pushing values of privacy, values of equality. They certainly have a rich understanding of those values. They don't have necessarily a sophisticated understanding of what's constraining them as they try to pursue them. Um, um, and as they try to pursue them and they find the effort of the court looks like it's becoming political and they pull back, they might not be able to be as deeply reflective on why they're pulling back, but they develop, they're, they're us, they're part of us. They develop an understanding of the society that, that really constrains how this constitutional project can go forward. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, that that reality is in some sense um, affirming because it says a democracy, our democratic understanding of what's appropriate, what's right, is ultimately constraining how the Constitution uh, progresses. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also terrifying because what that means is sometimes it can go what we would now think of the wrong way. So we were talking before we started about what I think of as the darkest moment, um, uh, most tragic moment in constitutional development when after the Civil War amendments, which uh, launched a project of reconstruction, which was in many ways the most creative, hopeful, um, radical moment of of reform in the history of America, um, very quickly got overtaken by a cultural, political, social understanding that basically denied the potential to the court mm -hmm. for making good on these constitutional promises. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of it going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, after a um, hundred years, it sort of began to work its way back from that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but sometimes it goes in the good way, which I think is you know, the story of gay rights in the way right. gay rights have been. Right. How would you define uh, the fidelity, uh, the original understanding of it? Because you're concerned about the meaning of words yeah. as well. That's what you mean by the meaning. Right. It's how judges understood contempor contemporarily the words and meaning. So how, how would you um, define fidelity as they understood it as lawyers today understand it and judges today understand it. Yeah, so, so the book is, is playing on two different kinds of fidelities. So the typical one we think of when we think of reading a constitution or interpreting any document is the fidelity to the meaning that the authors of the text um, uh, gave us. So the authors had a certain understanding of what they were trying to do, or a constitution of ratifiers, and we're trying to be faithful to that meaning. And that, I say, I think, is one kind of fidelity. It is the primary fidelity, fidelity to meaning. But in addition to fidelity to meaning, the story of our court has been a constant effort to preserve or to construct the institution of the Supreme Court, to make it possible for it to continue to have the role that it has in our democracy of checking um, uh, abuses of government power or enabling um, the systems of our uh, government to work more effectively. So that is a fidelity too. It's a fidelity to the institution of the judiciary, not the fidelity to the meaning of the Constitution. And what I'm saying is that these two fidelities 
are, hap are working, out, working themselves out together. So it's so not a fidelity to the framers. The first fidelity, the fidelity to meaning, every one of those justices would say the meaning they are enforcing comes from the Constitution. Whether it's the original Constitution or the amended Constitution, this is a meaning embedded in the Constitution. And, and we're trying to give life to that meaning. So that's, that's the sense of fidelity to the original meaning or meaning of the Constitution. But what I'm saying is, as they're doing that, they're also incredibly sensitive to whether their interpretation makes the court itself a weaker or a stronger institution. So this is Marshall in Marbury versus Madison. Most important example. McCulloch versus Maryland. Yeah. So in these, those cases, which of course were the founding sort of cases of our constitutional tradition, um, when you actually look at what Marshall did, for example, in Marbury, Marbury is the case, if you've, if you've heard of it, it's the case that is famous because it announces the power of the court to strike down the laws of Congress. Um, uh, but what's so important to me about that case is that if you actually look at the statute that Marshall interprets, and you read Marshall's interpretation compared to the statute, if one of my law students gave that interpretation of a statute, I would fail that law student. It is a completely <laughs> stupid interpretation of that statute. And so you think, why is Marshall, the great Chief Justice, so bad at reading a statute? And the answer is, what he is doing is he's trying to find a way to create a precedent that Congress has the power to strike down the statute with a statute that he knows Congress will never try to revive or resist. Um, and that was a strategic effort to build the institution of the court as an institution that can keep Congress in line. And of course, it does, does this, makes that decision in 1803. It wouldn't decide another case striking down a federal law until the mid part of the 19th century. So. Um, it's not something that they wanted to launch in and do repeatedly. But, but the, po the point is that in bending the meaning, they created the institution. So it's more faithful to the institution than to the meaning of the statute or the meaning, uh, in some cases, of the country. So, so this is Marshall uh, sort of in Marbury versus Madison losing the battle of Mar Marbury's case but winning the war yes. of review. For the institution of judicial review. Mm -hmm. And there's a second part of that, which is, you know, so in that case, um, you know, wh what had happened here is that um, uh, after the Federalists lost the election of 1800, which Jefferson called, um, you know, a revolution as important as the revolution of 1776. And the Democratic Republicans or Jefferson party swept Congress um, and uh, um, swept the presidency. Um, the Federalists began to pack the courts in the last days mm -hmm. before they were to leave office. So they created a whole bunch of courts, they filled a whole bunch of uh, offices with judges, they created a bunch of offices in the um, District of Columbia, they filled a bunch of them. And, and there's this mad scramble that happens at the White House as they're trying to get all of these commissions out in the <laughs> last moment. And, um, and Marshall is actually acting as, uh, you know, um, in a capacity as uh, an advisor to Adams before he is appointed to the Supreme Court to be um, Chief Justice. And um, he's actually present in the context when um, Jefferson, uh, when Adams signs the commissions mm -hmm. and um, John Marshall's brother is supposed to deliver the commissions <laughs> to all these judges. So Marshall's- That's like Bush, Bush v. Gore, yeah, 2000. Yeah, exactly right. So, so um, John Marshall, sort of, uh, John Marshall's brother uh, um, grabs the commissions and he can't carry all of them. So he leaves the White House, he leaves some of them behind. And then they have to evacuate the White House because the Jefferson administration is coming in and the Jefferson administration comes in and Jefferson apparently discovers in the drawer of the White House um, these extra commissions um, that were for people like Marbury. Um, and so um, Jefferson said, we're not delivering this commission. We're not going to allow this guy to become it because what the Federalists have done by packing the courts after the people have spoken in favor of the Republicans is outrageous. So we're not going to deliver the commissions and they can just, you know, they can do what they want. There's nothing we can do. So after um, he refused to deliver the commissions, Mar Marbury brings a lawsuit that says deliver the commissions. Mm -hmm. And the question the Supreme Court has to answer is whether 
um, the Supreme Court can force the president or the president's agent, John Ma uh, James Madison, to obey the law because the law basically made it clear he had to deliver the commissions. Mm -hmm. And in this case, um, this, the Supreme Court looked at this and realized, John Marshall, the Chief Justice, realized if he told Jefferson or told Madison that they had to deliver the commissions, Madison or Jefferson would have said, go to hell. We're not going to deliver the commissions. What, what are you going to do? Send your police force down? And the court is almost stillborn. Yeah, stillborn. So Marshall realizes that he has no actual power to force the president to deliver the commission. So what he does is, is again, completely brilliant from the perspective of building the institution of the Supreme Court. What he says is, okay, absolutely clear. If you've got a right, you've got a remedy in America. That's what justice is about. And so... Does he have a remedy in this court? If he had a remedy in this court, we could order him to deliver the commission. But it turns out the statute that gives us jurisdiction doesn't actually survive constitutional analysis. So he declares he has the power to order Madison to deliver the commission. But then he says, actually, we're not going to deliver, we're not going to issue that order because we don't have power. So in the same decision, he both asserts we can control the president and we can control Congress in a way that neither the president nor Congress could refute. It would make Solomon very proud. Yes, he <laughs> was exactly in this way, Solom Solomonic in his ability to cr create this precedent that then dominated or grew to dominate the whole way we think about yeah. judicial review because of the sensitivity, not to fidelity to meaning, but to fidelity to role. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm interested in sort of understanding the role of context, the consciousness of judges in terms of meaning, uh, their role in history, um, and how you might sort of respond to a critical legal studies perspective or a critical uh, legal perspective that looks at class or gender or race in the context of meaning at, at, the, at that given time, in Mar Marbury's time, in John Jay's time, in Marshall's time. How do you, as you talk about the milieu and the sort of uh, peripheral democracy on top of the core democracy in the, con I mean, constitution, you, you talk about a kind of people's constitution on top of the written constitution. So how does all of that sort of come into, into interaction? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great... I'm thinking of Roger Taney. Like yeah. in the opening, you know, you say the judges are well-meaning. So I'm thinking of Roger Taney saying that a black man has no right, that a white man is bound to respect. So I'm trying to understand Roger Taney in this way. Or, you know, Homer in, in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, the majority, with the exception of Justice Harlan, that talks about justice being colorblind. Or we could talk about Roe v. Wade. We could talk about, you know, Webster. A number of the cases, you know all of them backwards. Um, how do we, they're watching TV too. Yeah. They're listening to the radio too. The critical legal theorists say that, you know, a judge's opinion has to do with whether or not she had a fight with her husband that day or her partner that day, yeah. Yeah. as opposed to simply ideology. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to get at that. Yeah, so I, I don't think that's the best account. I don't think the, what you had for breakfast uh, <laughs> is the best account right. of, this, of this evolution. Mm -hmm. I, I do think the better account is to really understand what the context was at the time these cases are decided. You know, we, we like to tell ourselves this happy story about our Constitution. You know, these beautiful principles, Madison and Hamilton, hammer out and in a really fundamentally pro-democratic way. We should remember there's a flip side to that constitution that embedded slavery, uh, not just by not repealing it, by actually saying in the constitution that Congress couldn't even touch it for the first 20 years of the life of the constitution. So this beautiful document embeds as well a commitment to the greatest sin in the history of uh, the nation, right? Um, you know, maybe that's contestable, but it's still pretty high up there mm -hmm. um, given um, other sins right. that we could point to. But right. the point is, this is the, <laughs> this is the time. This is who they are. Right. And so when I say that they are, they are acting in good faith, I'm not saying they're good people. I'm saying that for who they are, they are acting 
with the ideal that they believe their, their, their office charges them with carrying into... It doesn't into matter whether they're good people with these constraints on them. Won't the constraints kick in, in your view? Yes. I think, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not saying whether they are good people or not. I'm mm -hmm. saying if we imagine them acting as good people, would these decisions make sense? And my answer is yes, they would. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that they get changed or uh, evolve because of the changing context is sometimes you know, relatively inconsistent with what you think their politics would be. So the best example of that is think about the extraordinary progress that's been made around gay rights in America. Mm -hmm. So what's striking about that is the justices who are most important in bringing about the revolution in constitutional protection for privacy um, uh, in the context of sexual orientation or sexual choice, the justices who brought that about were not liberal justices appointed by liberal presidents who were trying to change the world by making it liberal. It's Justice Kennedy appointed by Ronald Reagan <laughs> who becomes the most important justice bringing about the incredible progress from reversing the outrageous decision of Bowers versus Hardwick which said that it's almost facetious to imagine the Constitution protecting someone's right to engage in homosexual sodomy to, you know, the decision just uh, four years ago establishing the right uh, to marry regardless of sexual orientation. That transformation is led not by liberals but by a conservative justice because as the world around him and the court changed, there was nothing else that they could do except to acknowledge the changing understanding of our society that made it no longer even sensible to imagine the governments having a power to step into the private life of individuals. So, and so would that be the death penalty, for example? That was a great, I don't write about the death penalty, mm -hmm. as you know. Um, uh, it's a hard case mm -hmm. because the court, I think, got ahead of itself mm -hmm. and you know, pushed in a context where the public was not yet there, and the public pushed back pretty hard, and when the public pushed push, push back, the court retreated. It said, okay, we're not gonna insist on this doctrine anymore. There's some suggestion they might come back to it now that they uh, continued skepticism about the death penalty has grown, but mm -hmm. this is not an example, I think, of the court actually uh, executing this dance between role and meaning in, mm -hmm. a, in a really effective mm -hmm. way. Well, I think about like a case like uh, Greg versus Georgia, um, in seven, yeah, uh, uh, Furman versus Georgia in 72, and then Greg versus Georgia in 76. When you look at Brown v. Board 54 compared to Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, we're talking about 68 years yeah. the court took to get to that point. But in the death penalty, the court overturned itself in less than half a decade. Yeah, because I think it felt, it realized, I think, that it had gotten too far ahead of a society. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Plessy, so Plessy establishes separate but equal is not violate the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and that decision obviously had radical effects on embedding even more deeply the racist desires of many in society to segregate on the basis of race. Mm -hmm. It's not until World War II makes that position no longer politically tenable for the United States government. I mean, you know, we forget the fact that as the United States is entering or deciding whether to enter World War II, both white racists in the South and African Americans in the South are very skeptical about entering that war. White racists are skeptical because they're like, well, wait a minute, if we go over there and we fight racism in Germany, when we come home, people are gonna be like, why don't we fight racism yeah. here? And it's Jesse Owens saying it wasn't Hitler, that's it right. was FDR. That's, it, that's exactly right. And, and African Americans are like, why should we go to Germany to fight racism? There's plenty of racism to be fighting right yeah. here. Yeah. Um, and so the point is the war was understood as a war about racism. And if it's a war that we fought <laughs> to end racism, it was gonna have ramifications back here, and it did. Yeah. Because when the Supreme Court decided uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, the United States government came in there and said, look, the most embarrassing fact 
that the United States faces in our effort to beat communism around the world mm -hmm. is racism in America. Because what the communists are doing is they're broadcasting to the whole world the hypocrisy mm -hmm. of our claim to believe in equal rights and democracy. Like they show pictures of what's going on in, south, in the South in America and they say this is what they mean by equality. Mm -hmm. This inequality is... E and the United States government said if we don't end this policy of segregation, then our ability to yeah. spread the values yeah. of democracy around the yeah. world will be hampered. And those, that reality constrained the court to force them to un upend a 60-year-old precedent. Absolutely. I mean, the, pro the propaganda from the Soviet Union on one end. But, and I think it's less obvious now, but even ever since Ferguson, China has constantly talked about America's relationship to African Americans and civil rights and law enforcement, things of that sort. So China continues to use this to say, you talk about, you know, the cases of that, the, like we see right now in the news with, with the NBA and, uh, and the other athletes sort of talking about yes. the mistreatment of Muslim minorities there. They push back to, you know, uh, you're not as innocent in these scores as you, as you think you are. Yeah, and so this is a powerful pressure. Yeah, I'm, we're going to switch gears a little bit because I have a bunch of questions and I'm sure everybody's eager to hear their question answered. So I'm going to go ahead and begin answering those questions. And the first uh, is, what is your opinion of expanding the court to 15? So FDR. Here, yeah. <laughs> so here's where context really matters. You know, if we weren't in the middle of um, this really outrageously politicized environment for appointing justices of the Supreme Court, triggered in part by the refusal to allow Obama's last appointment to be confirmed, yeah. and then by the election of a president who you know, in some sense, didn't get elected even though he was elected, um, uh, you know, creating in minds of many lawyers the sense that they've gotten two extra justices, um, you know, that they wouldn't have gotten but for these flaws in our system. Um, it creates the sense that, okay, we're going to get our push, we're going to get our payback too. So they've cheated, so we're going to cheat. And the spiral of cheating against the norms of, um, of the judiciary begins to grow. That, that's of great anxiety, mm -hmm. causes great anxiety mm -hmm. for me, because I don't want us to go down that path. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think what McConnell, uh, Mitch McConnell did, I think Mitch McConnell's the dark lord of Washington, <laughs> D.C., and I think what he did was... Uh, <laughs> I think what he did was outrageous, and, um, and it's even more outrageous that he has the temerity to announce that if yeah. Ruth Bader Ginsburg stepped down or passed away in February of 2020, he would find no reason at all not to appoint a new justice before the end of uh, Donald Trump's first term. So the hypocrisy, the refusal to stand by principle, the refusal to do his job as a uh, as the majority leader of the Senate is astonishing, yeah. and I get it. I mean, and I'm outraged, as outraged as anybody, but this institution has got to be protected but, from but, becoming rendered. With, in with 15 so, protected? Yeah, so, right, so, you're right, so I've been talking too okay. long about this. You're a good point. I, I um, do the same thing. Um, it's, 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 it's being yeah, professorial, it's, it's okay. Yeah. okay. And you, you see how I knew exactly how to get him right back on yeah. track? Okay. <laughs> okay, so, but if we weren't in this context, would a court of 15 or something more like the German court with, that has a couple of chambers that decide cases and judges who turn over much more regularly be better? Absolutely. I think the really terrible mistake of our Supreme Court design is that these people get appointed for life and they think that that means they have to serve for life. You know, I mean, <laughs> justice like Souter are really an extraordinary exception. I mean, he's an extraordinary justice, but he at a certain stage of his you know, career said, look, I've served my time and I'm stepping down and, and let other people you know, uh, uh, pass to the court, but that the rest of the justices think they have to be there until they're carried out. And what that does is make every single appointment an incredibly important political fight and so it makes it even more contentious. The court becomes more politically contentious because of this design flaw. So I would love a different structure that had 
bigger court, more regular turnover, less political consequence with each uh, justice who was appointed. But I'm worried about the context in which we try to get that and whether that would backfire. Do you think history could outpace the U.S. Constitution in the way you talk about it with technology, with the way young people today get knowledge compared to those of us who from the 20th century, everything was about reading and writing texts and writing pens and things of that sort. You talk about this versus people that read mostly. Do you think the court, um, do you think history itself or time and technology is outpacing the court? Because you seem to be saying the court has to keep trying to make itself relevant by putting its jacket, new jacket, I guess putting the same jacket on over and over again to stay relevant in, in contemporary times. And so I'm wondering um, if you imagine a future where the court is obsolete because it just can't keep up with the, the demographic changes, the population changes, um, the polarization in American politics? Well, no. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that the sort of values which the court is charged with keeping alive or, or breathing life into are in some sense timeless for a democracy or a representative democracy. I think the real threat is whether technology undermines the capacity for representative democracy. So, uh, um, you know, I, I'm here really happy to be talking about this book about constitutional theory, which I've literally spent 25 years writing, and I felt like I just had to get it out before I died, and that feels every day like a sooner or sooner event. So mm -hmm. um, I'm glad that it's out, and I'm glad to be here talking about it. Um, I have a second book, which is I'm, I'm talking about tomorrow night at the Internet Archive um, called They Don't Represent Us, which half of that book is about the way technology has undermined our capacity as a people to even understand the facts that we're supposed to be deliberating about in a common way. You know, think about the difference between impeaching or trying to impeach Richard Nixon and the potential impeachment of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, in the context of Nixon, Though Republicans like Nixon more than Democrats, if you look at the support for Nixon, there's a perfect correlation between Republicans and Democrats in their support for Nixon. And when support for Nixon begins to fall, it falls with Republicans and Democrats at the same uh, rate. Mm. And the reason for that is we're all watching the same television, right? It's three channels and 60 minutes, and all of us are exposed to the same story. So we all know the same facts. Uh, Barack Obama about um, six months ago said, if you, if you uh, watch Fox News, you live in a different reality from if you read the New York Times. And what he's pointing to is the fact that today, this same impeachment story is not going to produce perfect correlation between Republicans and Democrats. Republicans are on one channel and Democrats yeah. are on another channel. Uh, and we are going to see the world in completely different ways. We live in a different reality. And the real challenge for democracy then is how do you act as a democracy when the people don't even live in the same world anymore? And if that's the reality that we've been brought to, that's not something the Supreme Court has the capacity to fix. And, and, and in your earlier work, you talk about how the people have a responsibility and how they've abdicated democracy if they see corruption in Washington, D.C. with, you know, with money, have we not also, you said, you know, failed to live up to our responsibilities, our role? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I try not to be hard on the people because there are many more of them than there are <laughs> politicians. <laughs> Especially when you're selling books. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I, I, but I do think that there, there's this sense in which uh, we've resigned ourselves to the broken and corrupted government that we have. And much of our politics like, kind of tries to pretend it's not there and, and look beyond it. You know, so we have races for president where they tell us about all the wonderful things they're going to do. But we all know that none of those things can happen so long as we have this corrupted democracy in Washington. You know, so you talk about the Green New Deal. You're not going to have a Green New Deal so long as the carbon monopoly continues to fund campaigns. You know, we want single-payer health care. You can't have single-payer health care when it's the insurance companies or the drug companies or the doctors who are funding the elections of members to Congress. Like, we cannot get anything substantial done in our Congress until we fix this basic broken institution of democracy, which has been broken by, you know, money and politics mm -hmm. and gerrymandering, all these ways in which it's been rendered unrepresentative. And again, problems which the Supreme Court just has no capacity 
to ever on its own fix. So, so then when I think about this corruption of money and then I think about Citizens United and then I think about the way you talk about uh, meaning and, and uh, the restraint around um, meaning, uh, you know, how, how, how then do you relate that? Because it seems like John Roberts, when he came in overnight, he overturned 130 years of, of, of precedence. In, in Citizens United. So if he's, and then yet in the Affordable Health Care Act case, he clearly is concerned about the role, it seems to me. So, uh, I mean, on one hand, he comes in swinging like he's Mike Tyson on day one. And, 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 then, sec and, and, and then, you know, when you have the Affordable Health Care Act case, he is concerned about not going too far because will history forgive his court for uh, overturning health care for millions of Americans. This is exactly the evolution that I think we should be looking at. You know, he came in swinging, and then he recognized he's the chief justice of an institution, the Supreme Court, and his job is to shepherd that institution across what have become incredibly difficult political times. So the Obamacare case, I say in the book, is one, you know, is at the level of John Marshall's Marbury versus Madison, because on the one hand, he, art he articulates a really creative, I don't think it's based in law, but it's creative <laughs> uh, technique for constraining the power of Congress's commerce power. He like creates this distinction, it's like bizarrely amazing that that sticks, but <laughs> there it is, they constrain the power of Congress's commerce power, and if that were the end of the decision, that would have meant Obamacare was overturned. But then he realizes, I think, it would be a disaster for the court, this conservative Republican court, to overturn the signature legislation of this Democratic president. Um, and so he creates a second, there's a second part of the opinion where he then finds a way to uphold Obamacare. Mm -hmm. So he upholds Obamacare after constraint, giving this constrained reading of the power of Congress under the Commerce Clause. Those two together allow us to look at what the court did and say, okay, well, they weren't activist in a political mm -hmm. way while seeding the potential for them to be very restrictive on the scope of Congress in the future. Mm -hmm. There have been other really amazing examples of this. You know, the most, the most astonishing to me was the recent census case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the uh, Trump administration has been trying to get um, uh, the citizenship question on the census because they know if they get the citizenship question on the census, it will enable them to basically gerrymander districts in a much more effective way than they are able to right now. Okay, so, so um, all of this fact of the intent of the political actors to enable the Republican Party to better gerrymander our Congress slowly was coming out as the court was considering the question of whether uh, the Commerce Department could put um, the citizenship on the, um, on the uh, census. And I think that it's pretty clear that the court began to realize that if it allowed the Commerce Department to do this, and all of this other stuff came out showing that it was basically just political hackery that had, and had been engineering this change to bring about support for uh, uh, the Republican Party, it would, it would embarrass the court. Mm -hmm. So Roberts made up a completely baseless reason for striking down um, uh, the Commerce Department's rule. And the baseless reason was he said that um, if the purpose of the regulation was ultimately political, not legal, it was a political motivation, then it's illegitimate. Mm -hmm. And people like Justice Thomas in dissent said, what are you talking about? Every single decision of an administrative agency is ultimately driven in part by politics. You can't tell me that we've been upholding decisions of administrative agencies without considering politics before. And mm -hmm. the answer to Justice Thomas is you're exactly right. He is making up this way of striking down this law so that the court itself is not drawn into the politically disgusting catastrophe of what the Trump administration had done to push this question up to the foreground. So there again, he's acting so as to pres preserve the institution much more than I think that he's like sensitive to the actual right. meaning. Let me get back to these questions. The, the Supreme Court uh, has issued seeming political rulings with poor legal reasoning. Hobby Lobby, Gore v. Bush, Citizens United. Is law less important than the political? Um, 
No, it's not. Um, we see, because they seem outrageous, these political decisions pushed to the fore. And, and I, I think we should criticize political decisions that seem driven by politics. I'm not sure I would agree with all of those being characterized like that, but certainly some of them. But what we don't see is the you know, huge majority of decisions which the court renders, you know, um, which are mainly unanimous or certainly unrelated to anything to do with politics of the justices. So we don't see the full range, and so we are more sensitive to the political. Now, I think that we shouldn't see any political. I, I think that to the extent we see any political, it's a failure of the court. It's a failure of the court to be sensitive to its role of preserving its institutional capacity. Um, but, um, but sometimes it fails. Do you think the, the lower federal courts do a better job of this than the, than the Supreme Court? No. No better? No. I, no. They, they're not as visible, so I don't know if they're constrained in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're constrained by other things, and, you know, it's a very, it's an incredible mix of judges. Now, one-third of federal court judges have been appointed by the Trump administration. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, we're going to see a pretty significant effect over the next 20 years because of that. Yeah. I wonder if there's a, the danger of overcompensating for the political milieu and not being affected or trying to stay neutral of it in, say, a Roberts court where uh, you end up doing nothing when you should be doing something, but you don't want to get caught up in the, 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 the politics yeah. of the time. Um, and so you see, it's almost like Nancy Pelosi with, with impeachment. It's like, you know, we don't, wanna, we don't even want to go there because of, it, you know, its ultimate um, uh, impact in terms of uh, overcompensation. Um, and so I'm just sort of wondering if you, if you imagine this. Yeah, I, I mean, I, there can be cowardice. So if what I'm telling is a story of fidelity to meaning, meaning they're reaching and trying to preserve or breathe life into a constitutional value over time, constrained by fidelity to role, which is when they're doing it, it becomes politically too costly to continue. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes their sensitivity to the political costliness of enforcing the Constitution can actually just be cowardice. Yeah. It could just be... You know, and, and that's what I mean by Pelosi. It's sort of yeah. like, okay, we should impeach, but we shouldn't because we don't want to lose 2020, so let's not do anything. Yeah. And it's like, but you are required. In one sense, you're required. But their defense would be, we're not required to destroy ourselves. Um, so, you know, we're required to a, to a certain point, but, you know, we should be sensitive to that point. So I'm, I think it's really important to be critical of what we see as their refusal to, to do their job in the name of preserving their institution. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's any way to understand the history of our Constitution without seeing a significant chunk of what they've been doing to be a response to the desire to mm -hmm. preserve the institution. Mm -hmm. So how can we uh, respect an institution, one, one querist asks, that cooked up the Bush v. Gore decision? <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, if that were the only decision of the court, then one shouldn't <laughs> respect that, that court. Um, uh. Um, you know, but even that decision was like kind of bizarrely conflicted, um, you know, because if you remember, um, one part of the decision was about whether the Equal Protection Clause required Florida to adopt the same rules for recounting across the whole of the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And that rule had never been announced before, that kind of application of the Equal Protection Clause had not been announced before. When we saw that that's what the court was being asked to decide, most of us said, there's just no way they would ever say that because this is brand new and it's not something you're going to impose in the middle of a presidential election. Mm -hmm. But seven to two, the justices said, yes, there is that constitutional obligation. But then the second part of the question was, so will we stop the recount <laughs> um, because it's too late for them to adopt the same standard? And... Um, you know, some of the justices who had basically established the standard uh, were then flipping to go to the other side and say, no, we're not going to stop the recount at this point. So the first part of the decision, it's hard to see that as political. Somebody like Justice Souter didn't vote that way because he wanted George uh, Bush to win that election. But um, it's hard to see the 5-4 that ultimately made George Bush the president as something other than political. I understand that's hard to see. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was, I'm just saying it's hard to see it as mm -hmm. anything other than mm -hmm. that. But that's not the only 
example. I mean, you know, my favorite example on the other side is, you know, Roe versus Wade launches an incredibly controversial fight about whether the Constitution protects the right of a woman to make a choice about whether to carry a pregnancy to term or not. And that fight becomes political almost immediately. Republicans, after about four years after that decision, they start taking this up as part of their charge to reverse Roe versus Wade. Ronald Reagan makes it a central part of what he's doing. And he appoints a series of judges, and everybody understands that one of the things that he's thinking about when appointing those judges is whether these judges will overturn Roe versus Wade. So when this finally comes to the moment when the Supreme Court is um, uh, going to consider whether to overturn Roe versus Wade, a, a case called Planned Parenthood versus mm -hmm. Casey, 1992, um, you know, you, depending on how you look at those justices, there could be seven votes on that court for overturning Roe versus Wade. Um, Certainly the justices O'Connor and Souter and Kennedy are three justices who most people thought did not think Roe versus Wade was rightly decided and would probably vote to overturn it. Those three justices, though, decide not to overturn Roe versus Wade, and they write an extraordinary opinion, um, which is basically, you know, my book. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> in that opinion, what they say is um, the only way our institution survives is if people have a reason to believe us as deciding cases on the basis of principle, not politics. And, you know, we've just been appointed by a president who said the only reason we're, you know, one of the reasons we're going to be on the court is to overturn Roe versus Wade. And so if we now act on that, mm -hmm. it changes the whole idea of what we do when we decide cases on the basis of the Constitution. It seems like the president is just controlling the Constitution through his appointment so, of the court. So then, you're just, so then Susan Collins is justified then in the Kavanaugh case where she felt like no matter what your fear is, it will sort out and he will align with the traditional uh, you know, modes of interpretation, et cetera. Okay, now you're going to make me seem really naive, so I don't <laughs> want to go down that. <laughs> I'm not sure where Justice Kavanaugh is going to be on this. I'm not sure what his obligation to Susan Collins really is. Um, I'm anxious about whether the court is as, from my perspective, enlightened as those three justices were. I mean, her career seems hinge on how he behaves. Yeah, yeah, which is the best, it's the best uh, you know, evidence that they're not going to address this before this next election. Mm -hmm. But in 2021, I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. will, will Roberts protect the larger role of the court or facilitate the ideological takeover of our po politics and government? So my view is he is more committed right now to um, the role of the court. And I'm not saying that's true for all those justices, all the conservative justices. I mean, most of them don't think of themselves as like working for the role of the court. They think of themselves as, you know, doing their work as a justice. So I, I clerked for Justice Scalia. I was his token liberal um, in in the chamber um, <laughs> uh, during a time when he hired a liberal. Like later, But you were an originalist, though. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say that I would have told him that I was an originalist <laughs> in any sense. I was a liberal. That's okay. how he understood me. Mm -hmm. um, late in his career, he didn't hire liberals anymore, and I asked him why. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, I figured everything out. I don't need to argue with anybody anymore. Uh, <laughs> but when I, when I clerked for him, you know, I mean, he, he was genuinely still trying to figure things out. And it was a really important, uh, you know, moment in my education because there were many cases where there was the conservative thing to do and the originalist thing to do. And he came, and his in initial instinct was to do the conservative thing. And we would go in, and we would beat him over the head with originalism and say, no, what you need to do is the originalist thing, because if that's what you say you believe in. And in every one of those cases, he eventually came around to do the principled originalist thing. So that led me to believe that um, you know, this idea of a justice living up to a principle as opposed to politics was possible. Um, now, you know, I don't think he lived that practice his whole career. In fact, the last lunch I had to him, with him before he died, um, uh, he didn't die at lunch, but, you know, <laughs> shortly after it's, he died, um, uh, you know, I, I said, you ruined me as a law professor because, you know, I had this experience with you, and then as a law professor, I constantly predicted that when you would have a choice between a conservative thing and a, and a originalist thing, you would do the originalist thing, and you let me down every time. Mm -hmm. um, and he laughed and he asked me, you know, which case. And I pointed to the money and politics case, most importantly. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, we had a long argument about the original understanding of corruption and what that would mean Congress should be allowed to regulate. And at, by the end of that lunch, I mean, he had a lot to drink during the lunch, so I'm not sure I'm <laughs> completely confident about this, but by the end of the lunch, he said to me, well, I think you're right. I don't think I have the authority consistent with originalism to restrict the power of Congress to regulate what I was calling then institutional corruption. And I thought, oh, this is great. And then he died. So um. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's a Chief Justice Vincent uh, Earl Warren joke yes. in there, but I won't say it. But real quickly, uh, well, Roberts, these are three related questions of, about impeachment. Uh, and I guess people are anxious to talk about impeachment. Uh, and we only have a few minutes, so if you could like try to do two-minute responses, that'd be fun. Uh, will, will Roberts have discussion? Uh, I'm sorry. Will, will Roberts have discretion to nudge the impeachment trial in the direction of fairness? One. How much can the Supreme Court continue to do in upholding the institution when confronted by a president who has amassed populist power and is unrestrained in its application? And what is your opinion of Donald Trump's impeachment? So the first question about nudging, mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, uh, when uh, uh, Johnson, Andrew Johnson was impeached, the Chief Justice uh, believed it was his role to act as a judge and make judgments on questions of procedure and um, administer oaths and enforce the value of that oath, which you might think, how can you take an oath to be a juror, Mitch McConnell, if you've already promised that you're going to work with the uh, defense to make sure that there's no conviction of the president, but bracket that. But here's the catch. Um, whenever there's uh, a ruling from the judge, Chief Justice, uh, it's possible for the senators to appeal that ruling. So they can say, we question the ruling, and the question then is put to a vote of the Senate. And if 51 senators can nullify. Um, vote one way that nullifies the decision of the Chief Justice, the Chief Justice's decision is nullified. So we can imagine Chief Justice Roberts doing the right thing in these cases, but it's perfectly possible for mm -hmm. the for Congress to resist it. So how much can a court stand up to a real, genuine, and um, competent tyrant? I'm not sure we have that yet, but we, um, um, I, not much. You know, the reality is the court is a weak institution. There's only so much it can do. It's a famous moment when, um, uh, when Chief Justice Berger was asked after the Nixon case, when they ordered Nixon to turn over the tapes, which led to him resigning. Um, you know, what would you do if Nixon had, had, had refused? And Berger said, well, I would have gotten the Supreme Court police and we would have marched on 1600 Pennsylvania, you know, yeah. making clear that it's completely nothing they could do. There's nothing you can do to stand up to him. Um, yeah. and, the, and the third part, you know, what do I think about the impeachment? I, I think it's absolutely obviously the case that the crimes charged are impeachable offenses. And the evidence seems pretty clear. And if it's an impeachable offense where the evidence is perfectly clear, then the consequence of a fair jury um, uh, would be to convict. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's not a conviction, then one of those three assumptions is not true. Wait, do you mind me asking, were you one of the 500 scholars who gave yes. an opinion about this? Yeah. You were? Yeah. Mm -hmm. did yeah they, so how did that come about? If you might, what, what, what can you tell us about how that transpired? Because well, nobody knows how that happened. It's just all of a sudden, 500 professors came together to say Kavanaugh or Trump is A. So how, do, how did that happen? Well, you know, we saw four law professors testify. Three of them said absolutely clearly this is an impeachable offense. And one said it wasn't, you know. And, and when I read his testimony, I was like, what are you? This seems really crazy. And then... Um, you know, and then when you look at the fact that when it was Bush, when it was um, uh, 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 the question of whether Clinton would be impeached, um, his positions on oh, impeachability were yeah. completely flipped. So it seemed a little bit weird. But many of us thought at that point, this is kind of embarrassing for the profession. I mean, this is not a hard question. I mean, there are hard questions, many hard questions. You know, I think there are a lot of hard questions around the Mueller report and the impeachable offenses in the Mueller report. I think all of that we can have fair disagreement about. But this question is easy. And I think many of us said, let's just try to express just how easy it is. So, you know, a bunch of people put together this initial petition and sent it out and said, would you be willing to say it's clearly impeachable? And we said, hell yes. And, you know, I think the number is now more than 700 who have joined. And, you know, we're trying to find out the people who haven't. And uh, we'll give you a list. <laughs> 
So, so that, that, I think, is a perfect segue for one of the questions that suggested why do, acad why do academies uh, overwhelmingly, why do college faculties, why are so many college faculties excessively focused on the left and even closely equal in their instruction of American values? Why are so many college faculties excessively focused on the left? Well, you know, hmm. so I started my career at the University of Chicago Law School which is not focused on the left. <laughs> um, you know, Judge uh, Justice Scalia was te had taught there. Justice uh, uh, Judge Posner was Kagan. there. E uh, Kagan and I started together. She was my uh, close friend when wow. we began teaching together That's in the same amazing. year. Um, um, but, the, you know, a lot of very conservative people there. This sort of issue is not a political issue. You know, the issue of the impeachable. So it's not a left-right issue. Like, it's just the question of what was the kind of wrong which the impeachment clause was designed to empower Congress to remedy. And if anything is the kind of wrong that the impeachment power was uh, designed to remedy, it is a political actor like the president using governmental power to benefit him personally, um, which is precisely the kind of wrong that this was trying to remedy. You don't have to be a liberal to see that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you know, conservatives see it as well. So these two things together, I think, mean that it's not always just simply left and right mm -hmm. that decides these questions. And even among conservatives and liberals, there are some questions we all agree on. So we have 10 minutes left, and I have about eight questions, so I'm going to try to get them all in. Um, in a recent interview, you proposed an Article 5 convention and a parallel shadow citizen convention. You write about this and talk about this a lot uh, throughout your work with a deliberate process. Are you or anyone else working to create the shadow convention? Um, and, and the other question related to it is, is a new constitutional convention feasible or desirable? Can, can it be done beyond academic treaties yeah. into the real world of American politics, given the power of Congress and given the polarization and the power of the, pol par the parties that have kept, for example, third parties from being yeah. factors? Because that would democratize the entire process if, third, if a third party could register in 50 states, but the two parties cooperate to make sure that a third party can't be viable. I think you mean conspire. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, uh, I do not support the idea of a constitutional convention. I support the idea of an Article 5 convention. So that seems like a pretty weird distinction, but here's the distinction. The Constitution gives us a way to propose amendments to the Constitution that Congress can't control. And the kind of amendments we need are exactly the sort that we can't trust Congress to make. You know, so the corrupted system that uh, uh, defines our elections is not a system Congress is likely to fix because they got there under that system. So we need a way around Congress. And that's what the Convention Clause was about. When the Constitution, two days before the Constitution was to be published, um, George Mason stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, the only way to amend this Constitution is if Congress proposes the amendment. What if Congress is the problem? And they're like, duh, of course, we made a big mistake. We have to create a way to amend, to propose amendments that Congress can't control. That's the only power we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to amend the Constitution. I think Congress is not going to make those amendments. I need, we at, think we need at least a shot at making them ourselves and an amendment a project to uh, propose them through a convention under Article 5 would be, would, be that, would be that. And I do think if we could get that going, we should also create a kind of shadow process of a re representative, randomly selected group of citizens who are given the same information about that, about that, who then would have a chance to deliberate about this, at least to inform the public of what we would think if we thought about it, um, uh, about the kinds of changes that would be. Would you support something like the National Popular Vote Initiative uh, of trying to undermine the Electoral College by effectively doing with the two states that uh, apportion out uh, Electoral College votes as opposed to winner take all? Yeah, so, the, so National Popular Vote is a very clever hack around the Electoral College. What it says is when the equivalent of 270 electors are a member of the National Popular Vote Compact, those states will pledge their electors to the winner of the national popular vote. That, in a single act, would make sure we have one person, one vote across the nation. Um, I support it. I don't think it will survive. Hmm. Um, I think it's possible it will be enacted. I think there are lots of things that I'm, I'm worried are going to push back against it, including the United States Supreme Court. Um, because the state 
has the states have rights too. The states yeah. as entities. Yeah. You they have the right to. They have the right to. And the electoral college represents democracy for the states. Uh, that's theoretically. Not, the electoral college gives the states the power to appoint the electors, and if they appoint a slate of electors who are, um, you know, in line with whoever won the national popular vote, that's within their power. I, think I guess what I mean by democracy is it, the, the way is the, the, the electoral college votes are, di are distributed across. It requires a presidential candidate to go to every small district as well. Okay, but that's, that's what it doesn't do. I mean, mm. this is really important. Mm. You know, the thing the electoral college has, has become is nothing the framers thought it mm. would be, right? Because the thing that defines the electoral college today is an idea that was not in the framers' head. The thing that defines the electoral college today is something called winner-take-all. Mm -hmm. So winner-take-all means the winner of the popular vote in a state gets all of the electors in that state, <laughs> which means that the only states that matter to a presidential campaign are the so-called swing states. So in 2016, 99% of campaign spending was just in 14 states. Yeah. You know, you don't matter to the president of the United States. Texas doesn't matter to the president of the United States. New York doesn't matter to the president of the United States. The states that matter are the swing states. Now, the swing states are not the small states. Pennsylvania, Florida, Michigan, Ohio, those are not small states. It happens that New Hampshire and Iowa are swing states too, but the thing that defines a swing state is that it just happens to be purple enough that it could go either way. But the problem with a system that allows the swing states to pick our president, you know, it's like as if we've outsourced the selection of our president to this country called Swing State America. Swing State America chooses our president. The problem with that is Swing State America doesn't represent America. They're older, they're whiter, their industry is kind of 19th century industry. You know, there are seven and a half times the number of people in America working in solar energy as mine coal. But you never hear about solar energy in a presidential campaign because those people live in California and in Texas. Yeah. You hear about coal mining because coal miners are in swing states. Yeah. So the point is the way the system has evolved has nothing to do with what the framers intended, yeah. which is why we ought to be talking openly about how to change it so it actually could give us a president yeah. who worried about representing America rather than worrying about representing swing state America. I mean, I, yeah. no, exactly. Um, I read recently of uh, uh, Robert Dahl's uh, uh, how, how Democratic is the U.S. Constitution, and I teach it in my class here, here at USF, and it explained that um, Wisconsin ends up about six, the voter the voter in Wisconsin's vote is 67 times more powerful than the Californians' vote, based on population of 40 million people, which is larger than about 17 or 18 other states combined. California should have about 24 U.S. senators. Yeah. Yeah, maybe so, not exactly like the senators. You, you know, you, we can be diverse about right, it. But right, the point right. is, no, that, that's exactly right. We have built inequality into the system. And there's nothing in the commitment of a representative democracy that should allow inequality. But to how exist. do you get the people, the everyday people? Don't they have to be primed for a convention? How do you get everyday beer drinking, baseball playing, football watching, Joe six pack American to take? This effectively a, 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 a conventional revolution. Yeah. To to you know, in other words, we've all thought for a long time that there needs to be changes, and yet we could all see, as you outlined in chapter one, the way the framers become revolutionaries in relationship to the Articles of Confederation. But very few people today would be willing to allow, without a amendment process and a a, a Philadelphia. 1787 kind of meeting, like you say in the book, 55 white men today can't go to in Philadelphia and create a new America. Yeah, that's right. Thank God for that. <laughs> uh, let, let me see if I can get a, a couple more questions, and we only have like three more minutes. Uh, the court grapples with many issues uh, not explicit in the Constitution. Big issues today um, uh, is explicit in Article One. How will the will the judges? Uh, how will they judge the powers of Congress to impeach? And, and related to that is, will the U.S. Supreme Court uphold congressional subpoenas to get information from the pro president? And then I got two more questions. So if you can get one in, I can get two more in. Yeah, my, my view is that this court is actually going to be very um, supportive of the process to impeach the president in the sense that they're not going to interfere with Congress and they're going to uphold Congress's right to get testimony from people relevant to the impeachment process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you, you can decide if you want to answer that one. I'll leave that to you. But this one says, town of Greece versus Galloway, justice has ruled that uh, in 2014, that cities can include prayer at city council meetings. This goes against the rights of Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, etc., alike in the conflict with the two religious cla- the religion clauses in the U.S. Constitution. How did this happen? The, the town of Greece versus Galloway. And that's yeah. my final question. <laughs> yeah. So we should have stopped before that question because, <laughs> because I don't understand that case either. Okay. Um, you know, the, the religion clause, clauses have created some of the most uh, difficult struggles to preserve meaning across time because what religion meant in 1789 is radically different from what it's meaning for us today. Mm-hmm. And it's become very politicized in a way today that I don't think it was even in 1789. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, I'm not going to sell Galloway as, as the best example of the fidelity in the book that I'm trying to sell tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so let's pretend that question was not asked. <laughs> and, and I, um, oh, yes, good, I found it. Okay, well, great. So... Um, we now uh, reached the point of our program where there is uh, uh, time for only one more question. And, and I guess that would be sort of, can you imagine, I mean, what do you see happening in, in you know, 10, 15, 20 years with the, the polarization, the direction of the country, how the court is trying to negotiate these changes, the demographic changes, America's browning, there's a sort of reaction, a reactionary element that thinks that if they could sort of hold these 18th century institutions to their original meanings, then they can keep the original dominant group over subordinate group social order. So then part of me, I mean, we don't have time to continue the conversation the way I want to, but I'm, I'm sort of interested in sort of, you, in the later chapters, you talk about Abraham Lincoln is almost constituting a, 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 new, a, a new social fabric and social compact. And so when you talk about fidelity and, and being true to these uh, ideas, is I want to know if, if you're going back to Jefferson or are you going back to Lincoln or yeah. you, go, you know, who, who, who are we keeping fidelity to? Because th- there's an interpretation that the America with the with the Civil War, that the true descendants of the of the Constitution was Jefferson Davis, not Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. That Davis was the true keeper of the framers. So if we're keeping fidelity and Jefferson is more right on the framers than Lincoln, who are we keeping fidelity to? in terms of the Constitution and its various meanings over time. It had a meaning in 1776, a meaning in 1787, a meaning with Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln seems to be the new beginning. So are we keeping fidelity to Lincoln or to Philadelphia 1787? Well, those aren't the only options. There's a Constitution of 1787 that, as I said, was both good and bad, really ugly tied with really good. Then there was a fight that Jefferson Davis had um, with Lincoln, um, which was not yet resolved by the time Lincoln was dead. Mm -hmm. And that fight finally resolved itself in three amendments being enacted to the Constitution that radically changed the commitment of the Constitution. It radically injected Mm -hmm. a principle of equality into the center of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, that principle was effectively suppressed for 100 years. And it's not until the middle of the 20th century that we begin to bring to life the principles of equality built into that constitution. But so when I say, let's talk about the fidelity to the constitution, it's both of those moments we have to synthesize together. It's both the principles of democratic self-government that uh, define the founding and the principles of a commitment to equality for all that define the Civil War amendments, Mm -hmm. that we have to find a way to continue to give meaning to despite the radical change in context that we've seen. So we're in crisis, do you have hope? Hope is a big word. Um, I have commitment. You know, I have kids, so I have commitment. I have kids, so I have commitment to try to make this system work. Because if we don't, then we've betrayed not the Constitution, we've betrayed our children. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lawrence Lessig, the author of the new book, Fidelity and Constraint, for joining us today. We'd also like to remind our audience uh, that copies of Lawrence's book are available 
for purchase outside the room, and he'll be signing out there in just a few minutes. And if I didn't get your questions, you can ask him directly. I'm James Taylor, University of San Francisco. On behalf of myself and uh, the Commonwealth Club and Lawrence, uh, we've taken away the gavel, but I'll knock on the door anyway. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>